Jaime asked me to cover what is copyright, how it works, uh, because you guys will be engaged in a lot of uh, stuff that is contentious, that can pose copyright issues. Uh, I'm going to talk about it today. Now, um, one thing I will mention, right? I hope that's clear. Do you understand that? Because that's very important. This is actually on your test. No, it's not. I just wanted to mention that I'm not a lawyer. I am a librarian. And everything that I say is a theory, right? I love that. I got this from the creationists. You know how they say that uh, theory evolution of evolution is a theory? So what I present is not copyright facts, but it's copyright theories. That's how I get away from being sued for giving you <laughs> legal advice that is wrong. Um, I also define copyright a little bit broader than in classical legal terms. Uh, if you, want, if you care about legal epistemology or the philosophy of law, uh, a lot of uh, theorists say that the law is what's written in the Act, in the Copyright Act, but what I'm talking about is a lot broader than just the Copyright Act because that's what you're going to be concerned about, is actually the difference between the law and contracts. Okay? We're going to be talking about contracts a lot because that's what's going to rule your life. As creators, as users of copyrighted content, you're going to have to read the fine print and I include that in my definition of copyright, although a lot of legal theorists would say that is private law, that is something else than copyright law, which is public law, written by the legislator. A little bit of a detail, but I have to put that up here because everybody needs a little epistemology on the Monday morning, right? There we go. So I'm going to talk about three things, essentially, for the next hours, and I do invite questions from you guys, okay? Now, we are filming this session, as you see with my brand new toy here. It's actually an old generation Sony NEX. 5 and cam, they came out with a 5R like last week, but you, you get a discount when you buy old tech, and I'm an old tech kind of guy. So um, if you do ask questions, uh, I will edit your voice out, right, and I will repeat your questions, unless you sign a waiver form that I didn't bring, I forgot them, I'm sorry about that, but Tangi's going to take care of that. So feel free to ask questions, because I will completely edit you out, right, uh, so don't feel afraid, and I won't mention your name or anything, I don't even know your name, but... Uh, so feel free to ask questions during the session. Now, um, a few details about copyright. So I will present how copyright works so that it's useful for you later on. I also talk about some very exciting stuff that has happened over the summer. We've had five Supreme Court rulings and a new law, which in copyright terms is like, you know, like having an asteroid hit the Earth, essentially. <laughs> so we've had, had that happen over the summer, and that's very recent, so we'll talk about that. And then the, my, the main idea, how does all of this work for you on a day-to-day -day basis as a media consumer and, and, and creator, as a media professional consumer and, and creator? Sounds good? Sounds like a plan? Yeah. All right. So copyright is one of the different types of intellectual property, right? Uh, you, and, and I see this happen a lot. People confuse copyright with trademarks, patents, industrial designs, and there's a whole list of different types of intellectual property. But it's, it's, it's like saying fruit and banana, right? So copyright is a banana, of a, which is a fruit, which is in the family of intellectual property, okay? Uh, and that's the one we're concerned about. Trademarks, uh, you may see those whenever you have products surrounding you. Look for the little R or TM logo. And that forbids you from doing certain things with that concept, with that phrase. That's what a tr trademark is. So it, everything that is intellectual property forbids you from doing something. So you have to understand what and how it works. Okay, we'll actually talk about that extensively later on. But think of that, it forbids you from doing something. So trademarks, if you're a company, forbids you from using some other company's name or trademarks in specific ways, but only for commercial speech. Okay, you could still use trademarks in your short stories or fiction, for example. There was actually a science fiction convention over the summer that discussed how to use trademarks. Anyway, so that's another story. Right? It's a whole other story. Patents, it's about making stuff. Okay? It's, like a, it's like a formula, a recipe. If you describe your recipe and make it public through a patent, right, then others are forbidden from using your re recipe for the next 17 years. But that's another story altogether. And then industrial design also may be applicable if you're making stuff, right? If you have iconic design, there's a way to use intellectual property in that way. But we're not concerned about that. I'm weeding all those ideas out and I'm focusing on copyright and I'll talk extensively about what it is. Another little caveat of something that is not quite intellectual property but is often associated to it is image rights. You know, like the idea that you control your face, your name, 
your anonymity, right? That is another, it's not quite intellectual property, it's not in the same family of rights, but it's, it's mixed up with copyrights, but it's not the same thing. The fact that you have to ask for your permission to be filmed or photographed, right? If you've ever been on an interview on TV, they had you sign that form that you never read, right? Well, that's, what ha that's your image, right? Which is not quite intellectual property, and it's definitely not copyright. Okay, it's a lot of stuff for a Monday morning, I know, but let's get going with copyright. Copyright applies to works. Works of art, works of music, text, image, video, all the kind of creative content that you see. Oh, and by the way, I'll be making these slides available. And the, and the of course, the, the film as well on my YouTube channel. <laughs> Come on, guys. Intermedia. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, no, don't worry about that. I have, I, this is all going to be online. Don't worry. So we have here artistic, literary, dramatic. So theater, right? Now, all of these, all of these things, all of these culture, essentially, is protected by copyright. And think of copyright as, so yeah, everything that we create in universities or intermedia, like our, our raw material and our output is protected by copyright. So copyright is about control. It forbids you from doing certain things. Specifically, it forbids you from making money off of somebody else's copyrighted work. And it forbids you from taking somebody else's work and claiming it as your own or modifying it without their consent. Those are the two things that copyright does. Okay, so it forbids you from using. Okay, so if I want to show a movie in a classroom, I can't. Well, until the new law passes, I can't at least. Because I'm showing it in public, right? And that's a reserved right, that's control. That's the control the owner of the work has over their work. So if, I, if they have that kind of control, I can't do that use unless they authorize me. Okay, so I'm giving you some concepts here, but the two main ideas are protect an economic value by forbidding somebody from using, so like downloading, a, you know, posting a music file on the internet, right? I won't get into the technicalities or whether or not that's legal in Canada because we can actually get into a debate. Uh, that's a whole interesting subtopic of copyright law, but I won't get into it. Uh, actually, posting a picture online. If you're not the the, the person who took the picture, you're not supposed to post it online, right? So you, and they, they forbid you from doing that so that photographers can make money off their pictures, right? Because it's so easy to do. Anyways, now this is the long list of things that copyright specifically applies to. And uh, it's a lot of stuff, I know, but the act is 80 pages long, and I'm giving you a five minute summary <laughs> of how it works. So bear with me here, let's read through this. Now, the first thing that we have is, I've mentioned the economic and artistic right, okay? And that's where moral rights come from, the artistic right. I have them here at the bottom, so I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so you have, as the copyright owner, the sole right to exploit, the sole, sole right to authorize. And what it specifically applies to is to produce a play. So let's say I wrote a play, and I want to get a bunch of friends in a theater, and produce the play, right, I have to ask permission to the author of the play. And there's a mechanism to do that, right? So that's producing. That's an example of the produce right, or produce a movie, right? To reproduce, so I have a picture, or I wrote a, a really nice poem, and you're the publisher of a magazine, and you want to include it in your magazine, you're going to be reproducing. Actually, more technically, it's a publish, it's a publication, but that's, bear, bear with me. So reproduction is making copies of something, and copyright forbids that unless you're authorized. Okay? So reproduction, executing in public, showing a movie, right? So if in movie theaters, movie theaters have to pay for that right to show movies in theater, but also in classes until the new law passes, and we'll talk about that in a second. Right? Sounds good? So produce plays, reproduce works of art, anything, execute in public, Publish, so I wrote a novel, a book, a short story, anything, and I want to publish it in the, in the world. So that's also, it's forbidden to do unless you have my consent. The idea of consent, right? Keep that in mind, the idea of consent. And then you have, these are the main rights of copyright. Then you have a whole slew of, of other ones, like uh, translate, that's a specific right. Uh, adaptation, so adapting a novel to a movie, that's also forbidden, right, in copyright. So understanding what is forbidden 
uh, is, is really important in the context of copyright because what copyright forbids is how you're going to be making money with your works. It also forbids you from using other people's works in what you're doing. And if you want to use it, then you have to apply a very simple process that I'll show you in a second. Right? I'm not going to leave you dry saying you can't do all these cool things anymore. That would suck, right? So anyways, so the sole right to exploit, the sole right to use, and it's automatic, right? As soon as you doodle something on a napkin, a copyright exists and applies. There's no formality. The copyright, uh, was that a question? No. no okay. Okay, <laughs> just a flanks. Um, so it's automatic. You don't, you can fill out a form in Canada and, and send 50 bucks to the federal government to claim your copyright. It helps to prove that you have copyright, but the law says that there is no formality. Uh, copyright exists as, as soon as two things happen, fixation and originality. Fixation is uh, taking a photo with your camera, is doodling, is, is, is putting it in a tangible form. And tangible means virtual as well, like digital form, okay? So doing a doodle in, 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 in a notepad or whatever, in Word, or just drawing something on a computer, yes, it's protected by copyright, as long as it's fixed and it's original, which means not a copy of something else, right? Now the question that you can ask is, how can Disney claim to renew copyrights when they just remaster a classic, right? And they just claim copyright for that year. Well, it is fixed, but is it a, an original, right? You know, like some of the classic Disney movies are from the 30s, so technically, and then, you know, Walt Disney died when? I don't know, in the 30s, late 30s, I think? So technically, some of their works would be in the public domain in Canada, which is when copyright expires. That's the term of copyright, right? So, but Disney, their trick is to remaster their work and claim that it's an original work. It's like a new work with a new copyright. But, you know, you may attack that claim. I won't do that here, but I would just want to show you some of the tricks that companies use to play with copyright. Question? Does that mean, though, that you can take the non-remastered version? That's an excellent question. The question is, does that mean that you could take the non-remastered version? I can't answer that question because I'm not a lawyer, right? But you would think that the version, the original version produced in the 30s, if it were digitized by the Internet Archive or some other major corporation or yourself, you could exploit it. Unless, you know, you don't want to face Disney lawyers, which they have a tendency to push the envelope a bit. So, and that's another, an, another trick corporations do, is they, even though something is clearly in the public domain, they start sending you cease and desist letters and they file a court case and you still have to defend yourself despite the fact that you're right. And they, they, they look at you and they say, oh, they don't have any legal department, they're, they're struggling artists, so I'm just gonna hit them with a, you know, a, co a, copyright fine, or a copyright infringement suit, and they still have to defend themselves, even though you're right. And that happens a lot. Anyways, but that's evil corporations. And I'm not going down that road right now, right? Uh, Disney's not so bad, I mean, they're okay, they make nice products, they make a lot of money, owned by ABC Corporation, I think. Uh, no, I mean, they own ABC, the news network, the, the TV network. <coughs> so I have to protect myself by saying good things and bad things about it. Uh, if it's going to go online, that's another thing you have to worry about. <laughs> Anywho, so uh, copyright expires. You may have heard this before. It expires after 50 years after the death of the original creator. If, you're, if it's a work created by multiple people, it's the last person who dies. So I advise my artist friends to live fast and die young so that they could create a vibrant public domain for Canada. Well, maybe not. Uh, if, it's, if it's created by corporations, if it's all, all those other scenarios, the, the things change, then you have to think about what happens if somebody's in the U.S. and somebody's in Canada and we're working collaboratively online on a project, who owns the copyright, which law applies. If you're in Canada, it's always Canadian law that applies. Always, 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 no question. But the problem is, if you want to make money with your work, let's say you're, uh, uh, you're creating uh, clip art and you want to create a clip art library, of your pictures and your, you know, and your and your work on uh, you know Photoshop and that kind of stuff, and you want to sell your works in the U.S. Well, you have to worry about how U.S. Work law works, because if you want to make money there, then that's U.S. law that applies in the United States, right? So imagine the scenario: you have this clip art library that you created with you and your friends in Montreal, and you have people who give you money from all over the world, and then you start seeing your images in magazines and, and book covers all over the world. Well, how do you deal with that international aspect of copyright. There's a whole section of the Copyright Act that, that works on that. We have to think about how copyright works 
globally as well, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation. So we talked about ownership, right? The original creator is the owner of the copyrighted work, but unless you work for a company, right? So uh, people who work for Ubisoft making video games, the default in the Copyright, copyright Act says you, the creator owns the copyright unless you're an employee. If you're an employee getting a regular salary with a phone line and a desk somewhere, your employer owns the copyright. Right? So it shifts. So it gives it to the original creator and then, or the employer. So you have to be careful. Right? So here at Concordia, librarians, we're part of the faculty union. Right? And in our union contract, it says that our copyright reverts back to us because the Copyright Act grants the, co the ownership of the copyright to our employer, but then our work contract reverts it back to us. So this PowerPoint presentation, this uh, video that I'm making is owned by me despite the fact that I'm an employee of the university by virtue of my work contract, which reverts the copyright back to me. So you can always play with the copyright ownership by contract law. Contract law is a huge element of copyright. Anyway, so that's ownership, and that's very important. You have to transfer in writing, okay? There are two things you can do with your copyright. You can lease it, or you can sell it. Think of an apartment or a, or a house. You can lease the house, in which case it's not yours, but you're paying for it, or you can own it, you can buy it, okay? So as a creator, you can, uh, you can license your work, that's the lease, is license, right? Or you could sell, which is a transfer. And a transfer always happens by writing. So when you're reading the fine print and it says, I hereby transfer ownership or I transfer copyrights to, you are no longer the owner of your copyrights. If it says, I transfer, okay? Then if you want to use your own creation, you have to ask for permission from the person you've transferred your copyright to. That's huge. Okay, so transfer in writing, and it has to be in writing. If somebody says, calls you up and they say, oh, can I use your image for my book cover? That's not a transfer. You need to transfer in writing, okay? But licensing is a little bit different. You can have a non-exclusive license by verbal contract. That's been recognized in the courts. But whenever you deal with people with copyrights, either have a form or an email. You know, email them and saying, uh, as per our conversation, we understand that you have a limited use rights, a license to use my work for so many copies of this book, or so many weeks, or so many years, or within the specific context. You have to deal with this legalese as a creator, and as a user of copyrighted content, obviously. Uh, so that's transfer in writing. So email is cool. Do that. Or letters. Moral rights. This actually applies even if you transfer your copyright, the, the economic part of your copyright. You're still the original creator, so you're allowed paternity. You're allowed to say, I am the creator of this work of art, right? And you're allowed to have the integrity, right? So there have been a few uh, famous cases. Uh, one of them is the Eaton Center in Toronto. Uh, the artist was gray, right? I guess Snow. Snow, that's yeah. it. He sold these uh, gray boots for the, the, the Eaton Center, and it was just this papier mache construction. And the Eaton Center paid I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars for these papier mache gray goose, and uh, they were really mad, like seriously mad, because they were expecting something a little bit more grandiose than a few, you know, papier mache that he could have bought at Walmart, I suppose. Uh, so there was this. So for uh, for Christmas, they put these uh, decorations, Christmas decorations on the goose, like red banners and stuff like that, to spruce them up. Michael Snow said, hey, remove that. That is not part of my artistic démarche. And the in center said, hey, we give you enough money for your, for your geese or goose. Uh, we're not going to you know, <laughs> leave us alone. And he won. The artist won because he had the right to the integrity of his artwork. And they had to remove the, the, you know, the decorations and give him a little bit of money. Now, the problem with moral rights in Canada is you, uh, you can uh, declare that you won't act on them. So as you're reading your contract, it says that I will not act on my moral rights. They're still yours, but you're kind of, you know, it's a weird trick in copyright law. Um, so that, that you'll see that a lot, where in the contract it'll say, yeah, question? Uh, do they have to give a warning first, or can they act right away? 
It has to be in writing. So always revert to whatever written documentation that you have. If you don't have any written documentation, then you won't, unless you're an employee, right? It's, this, is, this is key. And by the way, you are allowed to go to small claims court to enforce your copyrights. That is really cool because it's for, I'll get to you in a second. Uh, I'll get to you, uh, it, it's for $7,000 or less, you can sue somebody that you think is infringing and that reduces the legal fees, right? So you don't have to go to federal court. Uh, so that's really cool, right? Question? Um, so if, uh, if you're employed by someone, do you still have a moral right over the stuff that you do for them or is it the copyright owner that has it? That's an excellent question, very astute question, gold star. <laughs> the question is, if you work for somebody, do you still have moral rights? Uh, the answer is, I don't know. Um, I would think not, because you're not the owner, you're not the copyright owner. But don't, don't, don't quote me on that. But chances are that if you work for Ubisoft or any kind of big firm that makes any kind of content, you're going to be signing a really thick document when you start that takes care of all these little issues. It gets a little bit more complicated when you're like in the independent structures, like smaller structures that don't have all these questions. Make sure you talk about these things uh, as you or before you start or during the interview process or as you're negotiating these kinds of things with your partners or, or, or future employ employers. Uh, because if that's a concern to you, then you need to cover that uh, and, and make sure that there's an understanding. And the contract is a formal understanding, right? But the idea is that you have to agree, right? Sounds good? All right, so moral rights, integrity, and paternity, those are the two things. So integrity is the right to keep it as is, the way that you intended it in your artistic démarche. And then paternity is, uh, well, it's mine, I made this, right? This is my work of art, right? Is it an absolute control? I love this quote. He who lights this candle at mine receives light without darkening me. Right? Because you're thinking to yourself right now, I mean, if I borrow a book from my friend and read it, is that really like evil? Are they really losing a lot of money? Is somebody going bankrupt because of that? Isn't there a, a situation where I can use copyrighted works without having to pay, without having to ask for permission? Do you want to do the pause thing? Sure. Mike. So the idea behind fair dealings is that there are certain scenarios where you don't need to ask for permission to the copyright owner, you could just use without worrying about it. And in Canada right now, there are five cases, right, to fair dealings. I don't think I have that on the slide. Anyway, so five cases are private study, research, news reporting, criticism, and review. Private study, private study, research, criticism, Review and news reporting. No, wait. Private study research. News reporting. Sorry. Five cases. Criticism review. Doesn't matter. Art write this down. Articles 29 to 29.2. Because <laughs> that's what you should be reading. Go to the copyright ad and read it straight from there. Articles 29 to 29.2. Okay? So those cases, so when I'm doing criticism, in theory, According to Fair Dealings, which is, a, which is a, a, an article in the Copyright Act, it's not an infringement of copyright to use a copyrighted work for criticism purposes. How much, where, how it works out is a whole other story. But in theory, it's there. Okay? So criticism is a huge part. Imagine if you had to ask permission to say that a movie sucked on TV. The whole idea of being a movie critic would just disappear. What if you want to show a little clip that sucks particularly of that movie on TV? Well, you can, according to criticism review. And here's a hint. Um, if you do use this fair dealing rate, you always have to provide the source. So here's a tip. Let's say you have a video blog, right, and you want to start criticizing movies. Use the trailer, which is easily available online, and you say source, movie, year, right, and then you say from which website you've got the trailer from, and then you can use little clips from the trailer. Does that make sense? Right? So you say, Armageddon had some great scenes about the destruction of the Earth, but then, you know, it really sucked as a movie. Um, and you can use little clips from, from the trailer. But remember, every time you use a fair dealing, 
do claim fair dealing, you have to provide the source of what the artwork is and where you got it from. Okay, that's very, very important. Question? <coughs> Ah, I don't want to hear this. No, no, no. Question is, if you record yourself singing a cover of a song and you post it on YouTube and you make money, is it illegal? Now, I can't answer that question specifically. Let's say, because it's a, it's a legal question. But let's think about the copyright logic behind it, okay? Singing, singing a copyrighted song, right? That is a reserved right. That is like producing the song, right? Posting it on YouTube is another reserved right. So you're in the... You're in the uh, reserved right infringement zone of the copyrights. Okay, the making money part doesn't help, <laughs> obviously. Now, and here's where, and here's where this. So it, you may have to ask permission for that. And here's where I, I'm presenting you this logic, right? This is my logical flow of how to answer your question. Okay, so you're in this, you're in this zone. You're in the copyright protection zone. And you're using a, a, a controlled right, a reserved right, and copyright. Okay, so if it's a fair dealing, then you can use. Or else, if there's an exception that allows for it, then you can use. Or else, you have to ask for permission. Now, you can claim that it's criticism because the fact that you're singing it criticize. I mean, you could claim that. Or you could claim that you're reviewing the song by saying, here's my favorite song, and then you sing it, right? I'm, I'm, I don't know if these are true cases or not. These are strategies that you can use. Um, there's also in uh, Bill C-11, which is the Copyright Act that was passed, the Copyright Modernization Act that was passed over the summer, um, they do talk about the YouTube exception, whereby if it's just for personal fun and, and just for kicks, Right? Not necessarily making money, but you can monetize YouTube videos. I know you can do that. You don't actually make a lot of money. You make some money. Um, but uh, uh, it actually allows you to post it online without having... It's like, it's like a specific exception. But the act is not in force yet. But it, it would allow that kind of stuff without the monetization part. Okay? Um, so there you go. This is my process. So unless it's an all rights reserve, is it a fair dealing then use? Else... Try to find an exception that would allow the use, because between articles, uh, tw in, in ar between articles 29 and 32.2, there's like 25 articles that tell you you can do specific things in specific cases. Fair dealings is the most important one for what you're trying to do, because most of what you'll be doing is either criticism review or news reporting, or else you can't do it. Uh, Bill C-11, the new copyright act, which is actually chapter 20 of the Canada laws of 2012. That's, anyways, don't, don't get me about, don't get me going about footnoting laws because I'm doing a PhD in law. It's pretty insane, but um, uh, it will allow in fair dealing three things. It will allow education, parody, and satire. Things that were not allowed in the Copyright Act in Canada, but will be as soon as Bill C-11 passes. So this is kind of my mental process. So for your question, yes, you're in the copyright control zone. You're using a copyrighted song, and then you have to fit in one of those boxes to use. Question? You know what some titles are necessary? That's okay. Um, when artists were, for example, friends told me that at one point, said everyone upload their covers and see who wins with the kind of thing. Is that yeah. basically him giving permission that people do not have rights to the cover of yeah. your song? Yeah. That's a great question. So, uh, Britain, I uh, repeat the question for everybody. So, uh, Britney Spears, uh, says says to artists, to, to musicians, cr upload your covers and let people download them and we'll do a download contest, essentially, right? Now, um, technically, the irony behind that is she probably doesn't own her copyright because she probably has a contract with a music label that forbids her from authorizing the use of her own songs. I don't know what kind of contract she has, obviously. I'm just guessing. But usually that's what happens with major... With when you have a label, is they take control of your copyright because that's what their role is, is to help you monetize on your content. So she probably cleared it with the publicist of the music labels. And they're buying each other out anyway, so there are not that many left, the big ones anyways. Right? So it may just have been a big media ploy, which has been cleared by the legal departments. So you would be in the 
right? Now, music in Canada is a weird beast because we do have the right to copy each other's music, technically. Yes, I am saying it on camera. We have the right to copy each other's music because we have a blank media levy. Because, you know, remember CDs from like a million years ago? <laughs> and cassette tapes? My God, I remember cassette tapes. I remember going to my neighbor's house and making mixtapes. That's where, that's, that was the fun in 1985, right? <laughs> that's what we did for kicks. So whenever you got that double tape thing for Christmas, you were in, because everybody was going to your place with their like bag for a photo of cassettes and we'd make mixtapes. We used, we would pay a levy, like a little tax. It's not a tax, it's a levy, but it's a tax. But it's not a tax. On the black media, so that we would have this right to copy each other's music. Actually, the regime was uh, enshrined in the 1997 revision of the Copyright Act. Um, but the problem is we stopped using black media and we started using phones, which are, or, or, you know, iPods or whatever, which are essentially computers. And the law says it has to be black media. It cannot be a computer. And twice, uh, the private copying uh, agency, the people who manage the money for transferring of music on the, on the blank media, they tried to get digital readers included in, in the definition of blank media, but twice they failed because the Canadian Retailers Association and other lobby groups like that, on the other side, like Future Shop, doesn't want a, you to pay a tax on buying an iPod in their store because you would just go to the US and not pay the tax. Uh, they had that reversed. So music in Canada is a weird beast, and that's why we haven't had the, uh, you know all those little court cases that you see that you get a fine for three, four thousand dollars because you downloaded a few songs in the U.S. We haven't gotten that here in Canada because in 2003 the Supreme Court decided that our privacy was more important than American copyright. So we haven't had that issue, right? But that's a whole other that's, that's a whole other set of issues that actually fits in the kind of exception realm, if you want. And music is a weird piece. But anyways, I didn't want to get into that. Sorry about that. I'm going to move on. But this, this makes sense, right, as a process? That's kind of what I want you guys to have in mind. And everything, every line here is usually a contract, especially here. This is a contract. Let's take a breather here. Let's think about this for a second. Forbidden, authorization, contracts, use, use of other people's works, use of my copyrights. Forbidden, authorization, forbidden, authorization, contract. All right? Lots of words I repeated. Question in the back. All right? So the idea here is that artists band together to transfer their copyrights to collecting societies, and they manage their copyright for you. CARFAC, you may have heard about this acronym if you're in visual arts. No? We have that over in class. Okay, so you have it. So the idea is that instead of every creator having to deal with every other creator in the universe, while people just band together in societies and, and clubs and organizations and groups and federations and whatever you want to call them, and they say, you know what, here, you, you manage my copyright. So whenever I want to make a photocopy in Quebec, I would call Copybec and say, hey, do you have this author's works in your catalog? And they say yes or no, right? So if you want to use images, or different kinds of things, you would go to the Copyright Commission of Canada, which is a federal administrative tribunal, and they list the, eight, the 60 recognized collecting societies in Canada. And they cover things like different kinds of uh, like images, playwrights, uh, text, different kinds of things for different uh, groups. Okay, So that's one way of fixing this problem is by having creators ask collecting societies to deal with their copyrights, and then collecting societies try to work together to make this a global network so that you can use a Belgian song for your mixtape, for your remix as a DJ, and then you would just pay them a license based on your use, some kind of process like that. That would, that would facilitate the process, in theory. But then, in cer certain countries, you can opt in, opt out of these collecting societies. It's not perfect. You may disagree with the amount of money that you get. So it's not a perfect system, but this is one of the ways that they try to fix some of the issues with copyright, specifically transaction costs and information costs, like trying to find who is the owner of this copyright and how much it costs to make a photocopy. That's good. And of course, there's also the free option. Right? Creative Commons, I don't know if you, well, you have heard about it, because it, it's, it's in the Fred Tyler's uh, movie, uh, is it's a license, it's a contract. It pre-authorizes 
uses, depending on the kind of license that you select, right? I used to be the interim head of Creative Commons Canada, uh, so I know a little bit about them. When you go to the Creative Commons website, they ask you a few questions, like if you're the creator of an original piece of work, like my picture that I showed you a while back, I could go to the Creative Commons website, and then the first question it asks is, do you allow commercial uses? Yes, no. And do, uh, can, how do, can others reuse? So I can say share alike or not share alike. And I answer these questions, and then they give me the license that applies to a piece of uh, work that is protected by copyright. And I, I can decide to make it available, and it pre-authorizes a lot of uses. Question? Well, that the person owning this It's your picture of your house, right? That's a great question. Okay, so the question is, I take a picture of somebody's house, and they don't want me to take a picture of their house, can they sue you? Well, they could sue you for any reason, whether or not the court allows it. Uh, in France, architects are given a copyright on their buildings. So you can't copy a building in France. So you, would, so you would have to go back in France, I mean, you would have to go back to that process and claim a fair dealing or an exception or get permission in theory, right? I want, I want to answer the question in Canada. Is it mostly to the people? It's only in the, the image rights that I was talking about that it, at the beginning, it's, it's really because of your, your, uh, your civic rights, your, your, you know, your uh, fundamental rights. It's privacy. It's linked to privacy. And house is, a, is another issue, right? I could actually give a whole presentation about image rights, like a whole hour, how it works, when you have to ask for permission, what kind of permissions, that kind of stuff. So Creative Commons is a pre-authorized, it's a license, it's a contract that allows you to do certain things before having to ask. And it's very broad, it's very, it allows you to do a lot of stuff, okay? And you have the open access movement, it's linked to, to Creative Commons. So, like for example, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a, big believer in university's role in open access. So that's why I want to film myself, put this presentation online, make it easy uh, for people to use and find, and have very permissible copyright terms. So like, I'm going to post my video under a Creative Commons attribution license on YouTube so that if you want to take it, remix, and, and use it, I mean, don't make me look bad, please, but <laughs> actually, I don't, I don't mind if you do. I have a thick skin. Uh, so that's, that's part of the open access movement, and a lot of people uh, it doesn't mean that I won't ma be making money off my content. And that's the, that's the weird thing about, about online, is you can monetize your content in so many different ways that free, having free access to some versions of your work becomes part of a, part of a whole context of how you make money, right? Because I may get in, invited to more conferences and get you know, put up in a posh hotel in some European country because I have a lot of really interesting content online. And I wouldn't have gotten that like little uh, candy without having posted content online for free. So that's kind of the paradox that you have to think about. Yeah, free, but not necessarily the high-res full version of my work. Maybe a few samples, maybe a few songs, and then you sell the rest. So you kind of to entice people to buy. And it's part of the different basket of, of things that you can do with the very same work, right? Low-res, uh, thumbnail type stuff for free, high res poster quality, paid for. Question? Uh, if you create something out of Creative Commons and. And you create something on yeah, a. Yeah, if you create something out of like that website or. Yeah. You know, archive thing, you can still monetize it and still create some kind of revenue from that website or Excellent question. Excellent. There is one type of Creative Commons license that you have to worry about. It is the share alike, which essentially means that if, if there is the share alike clause, then you have to share your new work or derivative work like the terms before. So it kind of imports the license to your work. You may care about that or not. Um, uh, but it, this actually, if I take that question, and, and so that answers your question, I hope. If you want to take a step back and think about any use of copyrighted content, whatever the terms of the license says is what you have to abide to. Like for example, YouTube. If you want to use a clip from YouTube into one of your own creations, there is a terms of use for the YouTube website and you have to read 
those terms of use that tell you what you can and cannot do with the content. The default position is that you're forbidden from remixing stuff from YouTube because that's how copyright works. Copyright forbids you from the get-go. So then you have to think about what you're granted as a right through the YouTube license. And that's why YouTube has started allowing Creative Commons licensing. Because there's the standard YouTube license, which forbids you from doing <laughs> any remixing or most remixing. And then there's, uh, you can choose the Creative Commons license, the, which is the attribution, which is the lowest form of protection that you can get from the Creative Commons licenses. Because it allows for commercial use, essentially, the, the yeah. attribution in, in, in YouTube specifically. So you have, even if you deal with a collecting society, to use, let's say, an image in one of your, in one of your art pieces, uh, you have to look at what the collecting society allows you to do or whatever publisher allows you to do within the context of that contract. So you have to understand the contract by which you're using somebody else's copyrighted works within your own. And that's where contracts are super important. And the idea with Creative Commons is to pre-authorize certain types of uses that are geared towards you know, certain end goals, like for example, amateur work or educators, like people in universities use Creative Commons a lot as licenses. Does that make sense? So th that question applies not only to the Creative Commons share alike clause, but to any clause that you're incorporating for an artwork that you're incorporating in, in your new creation. Okay? An art store, that's my little clin d'oeil. Art store is an example of an archive that you have pre-authorized access to. Because of library acquisitions budget, the library spends about $5 million a year on stuff, of which well, almost half goes to digital materials. There's an art store license that tells you what you can and cannot do. And actually, if I understand the license correctly, Sonia, and correct me if I'm wrong, you can use it in your, in your uh, student projects, but no derivative work, so you can't remix too much of it. Uh, so like, putting the image in your paper is okay, but like taking the image and doing a lot of funky visual stuff to it and posting it on YouTube is not okay, right? So that's art store. But it's art store is a is a database, is a system where we have a lot of artwork on it. Okay, think of it like Flickr, but that we've paid for. And and the contents of art store are images from museums. Okay, and so museums have put all their images in this big in this big you know pot, and then libraries buy access to them. And then you're going to say, yeah, but you know, stuff from the 16th century, from Leonardo da Vinci, is public domain, right? Well, the Louvre claims copyright to the Mona Lisa. I'm sorry to say. Actually, Corbis claims copyright. Corbis is the uh, uh, is an is image agency claims copyright to the Mona Lisa because they digitized it. But that's another story. Uh, but Art Store authorizes certain things that you can do with these images specifically within the context of your work. But you know what? I'll, I'll tell you something. Don't get discouraged. You know if you're jamming with your buddies in your basement and you're playing like Metallica songs, don't worry. Do it. It's okay. As long as you're not filming yourself and posting it on YouTube, it's okay to use stuff for your own research and learning and that kind of stuff. It gets a little bit more complex when you want to start sending stuff to, uh, you know, like uh, music festivals and that kind of stuff. If you want to start using it as a professional, then you have to understand copyright as a profession. Okay? So these are pre-authorized versions. And then, I mean, I'm not going to talk about Google because I had this whole thing about how Google was trying to test the limits of copyright by using stuff and scanning stuff and, and using it without permission, but they got sued and then, you know, they started to make deals with different people to settle the suit. So I'm not going to go into that because I don't have a lot of time. It, time's flying quickly. Class ends at 11.30, right? Oh, okay, so it's not too bad. But I still have uh, 87 more slides. Um, so I'm kidding. <laughs> it's 82. Come on. Uh, but Google was an interesting case of trying to push the envelope, then getting, getting, uh, uh, taking a step back and trying to make deals instead and share money with different stakeholders. That's been their strategy. And they've actually settled a lot of different cases. Uh, especially in the book in the book world, but you guys are not as interested in books because books are boring. And old. That's my world, so I'm going to skip that. Now let's talk about the main idea. Here's the main idea that I want you guys to keep after having me blab for what an hour almost. Here's a quote from a law journal, Columbia Law Review, from July 1945. And by the way, this makes it criticism and review. The source, JSTOR. Reproduction for the purposes of criticism and review. 
right? And I have here the name of the journal. This is my footnote, essentially, in a PowerPoint slide. That's how I make it okay, even though this is a reproduction of a copyrighted work. Copyright is the Cinderella of the law. Her rich older sisters, franchises and patents, long crowded her into the chimney corner. Suddenly, the fairy grand, uh, grand godmother invention endowed her with mechanical and electrical devices as magical as the pumpkin coach and the mice footman. Now she whirls through the mad mazes of the glorious ball. The idea here is that copyright was kind of boring, but in 1945 they said, look at this, now you can make copies of books quicker and you can reproduce scores for player pianos. That was actually the turn of the century. Every time there was a technological innovation, they had to rethink the boundaries of the different boxes that I showed you within copyright. And this is from 1945. This is like a million years ago and a half. And it has been like this since the invention of copyright, since the idea that the law forbids you to do certain things. So we're not out of the woods yet. So the law, copyright, or image rights, or patents, or trademarks, or any idea, the law, forbids what technology allows. That's why I'm here right now. That's why I'm doing a PhD in law. Because of this very simple paradox, right? And of course, now we're all creators and users of copyrighted content. Before, it was very simple. You had a chain link right? software you on your computer. You choose. That's why you're responsible, right? You can think about pre-authorization, so Creative Commons, collecting societies, um, uh, other types of licensing, like obtaining things from libraries, making sure you read contracts, right? Pre-authorizations. Then you have to think about practices in various disciplines. So if you're a journalist on TV, well, the news reporting fair dealing exception applies to you. But then you have to look at how others in your field invoke this exception and how it works within a specific profession. Okay, so you have to understand how things work in various disciplines, in your various fields of artistic activity. Right? Then of course there's, I always, I call it a academic integrity, but the idea that you have to quote your sources of some, somehow recognize the contributions from other creators and how they work within your works of art, right? And how it works within, in, in universities, it's very enshrined in a specific code, like you have to footnote things and you have to provide the source of things, right? But in various disciplines, there's like the integrity or the ethics of your field that you have to respect, right? And that's really for you to understand. And then the last part is institutional policies and practices. Like if you go to work for a major corporation creating content, you have to understand how they view all of these copyright issues and how your work contract works out and if they have any kinds of fair dealing policies that you have to, to, to think about, right? This is kind of like what you have to, this is your work whenever you're engaged in a, an artistic endeavor. And the idea is that, especially in intermedia, it's such an emerging field, it's such a new field that it's hard to know what professionals would do or wouldn't do, right? Because this hasn't been enshrined yet, the practices in the various disciplines. It's so new that you don't know if DJs can sample. And you don't know what happens when you take just a single image, you know, let's say if I had a, a single image on a single slide that was uh, Creative Commons share alike, does that make my whole presentation share alike? Or just that slide, right? I don't know. It's not clear. Okay, so those kinds of, those are the issues. And we're actually, it's very exciting because by virtue of the creations, the things that you'll be creating and using as professionals, you're actually writing the law in a certain way. Because by mixing these different tools and the contracts that you seek and the fair dealings that you invoke, you're actually shaping the boxes that I was showing you earlier on. And that's very exciting, right? And I hope that there's going to be some flexibility for artistic creation with other people's work, but then not too much money making off other people's back, right? Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, there you go. So, I don't know, uh, you guys, there's what, 15, 10 minutes? Any questions? Any burning thoughts? Any disagreements? Dis disappointments? Yes! Thank you. Uh, another specific question, but um, last week I was uh, listening on uh, Boras Economic on YouTube, and there was this note from YouTube that said that they decided not to, couldn't, they couldn't put the original song version, and so they put another song. So I really was wondering why was YouTube taking a responsibility for this video posted? Very simple. It's a $1 billion question. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, YouTube, which is owned by Google, I hope you know that, Google being uh, uh, extremely rich, right? They have $12 billion in cash sitting around and they're in just in cash, right? The revenues are like billions of dollars a year. They have 35,000 employees. So it's, it makes for a rich target. If you're a song company and you want to and you want to sue someone, suing Google is a great idea. Yeah. Where was it? There we go. <laughs> So um, that's what they did, is they decided, so Viacom and a bunch of other content companies like TV stations, music labels, sued Google. And so in the United States, they have a different, the, the copyright works slightly differently because they have the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. I didn't talk about that at all during this class because that's the US law and I wanted to talk about Canadian law. But the idea is that in 2002, the US government recognized uh, a uh, safe har harbor provision for people who are just hosting content. Because YouTube can control the content that goes on its servers, right? And so it's, it, it just was happy because it just said, oh, well, we don't control the, you know, what's the, what's, what are the recent numbers? Like Google, uh, YouTube gets 24 hours of, of, of video every hour. That's how bad, I think, and that's even a little bit old as, as a number. Like, I think it's even worse now, but... Uh, the idea is that they can't police everything, right? Uh, but then, of course, the content creators objected and sued Google for like a billion dollars. And so part of the settlement, because they didn't want it to go to Dragon Court and seeing if the safe harbor provis provisions apply, they started using algorithms to try to spot copyright infringement, right? And depending on what happens, they actually have this process now where a copyright owner can... Uh, can notify uh, YouTube that infringement is happening and YouTube has to diligently pull the content from its servers as per the safe harbor provisions. So depending on who owns which copyright to which part of which movie, and it goes to the song level, right, the people who created uh, Wallace and Gromit may not have had the, the right to post the song online. They may have the right to distribute the song with the movie on DVD, in movie theaters and video cassette worldwide, but they may not have gotten the right for that song for internet use. So they can't put the movie online on the internet with that song. So then that's why they probably switched it. And YouTube has has to receive infringement notices and act on them by pulling content. Does that make sense? Okay. Is it because it's a big company? Because it's a big company? You, sh you should always obey the law, <laughs> independently of your size and how, you know, if you, even if you think you can fly below the radar. And the idea is, the smaller you are, and the, you know, you can say, oh, they'll never notice me. But then, your content isn't as usable as before. Because you're not engaged as a professional, you're definitely an amateur. You can't start making money off your work because you haven't respected full copyright. Right? So, that, that's, yeah. Cool, yeah. um, what about converting YouTube videos into music files? I know there's a specific website where you can, you know, put your link in and transfer it into music file. And um, I know that there's some that it says you're not allowed to do, and then it says to sign a petition to support, you know, that kind of thing. So. You know, you could claim that you want to do it for your fair dealings. Because it's for your own private study and research that you want to keep a copy of Wallace and Gromit on your computer because you want to refer back to it to reflect, you know, reflect or research, whatever. I don't know. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's, it sounds to me, I don't know about the specific case, but it sounds to me like an interaction between these three boxes. Right? But that's, that's the best I can do. Uh, any, que uh, any questions from this side? before? Because I'm always looking at that side. guess not. So, yeah. Become a lawyer. That's 
that's my solution. Or a librarian. Um, no, but see, the problem is, the problem is, and you put your finger on it, it's all a, a transaction cost. And the Samsung Apple issue is really more a trademark issue, but it's, it's analogous. It's the same. It's the same problem, right? Because you're, you know, the law forbids what technology allows, so we're in this quagmire, right? Um, and you know, it, it, it took 400 years for books and the book industry and the publishing industry to stabilize. If you think about it, right? So think about music. Think about all these different cultural industries. Theater and music have been around for much longer than books. And what's been accepted as industry practice, right, needs to change. So it's going to take time. Unfortunately, it's going to take time to figure out how things work in various disciplines and what's allowed and disallowed, but we're still at the, at the border between the new and the old where we have to, and it's the same process, the same cycle that we go through has happened when you had um, uh, those uh, uh, mechanical pianos, player pianos, and came out with sheet music. Musicians were afraid about that and they tried, so music companies started to move on the copyright ground for the, for, to stop that, because any, any sheet music Printer, hole puncher, anybody could create those those uh, sheet music. So then, people who own the copyright to the music said, "Stop! We need to authorize that. We need to regulate that within our copyright." And then it stabilized, and people moved on. So there's this kind of cycle that happens. The problem now with with technolo te technological changes is that they're so broad and fundamental and across the board, and particularly these two paradoxes. This one's a huge one, creators and users. The industry hasn't figured that one yet. Apart from time, I don't see, and a lot of lawsuits, I don't see uh, how we're going to get out of it. I guess it's just kind of the expense of all of us. <laughs> Absolutely. There is a dead loss to society because when you take a right, when you take something, and this is, this, I, I didn't get into the economics of, of, of culture. Right, because that's what it speaks to. You have uh, the same cultural work, right? Like a book has a. Um, it's a. Uh, sorry, I spent a week speaking French because I was on vacation last week, <laughs> so my English is a little bad. Uh, but it's a uh, um, uh, uh, commodity, right? It's like it's like it's a commodity, but at the same time, it's a public good. The public good is that anybody can gain from it by using it. You can learn. You can grow. Right, by listening to music or reading a book. But it's also a commodity because you have to buy a copy of it and you can't use it in certain cases. Right? So it has this paradoxical situation where a market needs to emerge, but there's a dead loss to society because everybody has an advantage to use it for free. And if you look at this problem from the perspective of a librarian, I get $5 million from you guys and from the government and from the university to buy a whole bunch of rights and make everything available for free. So I'm like the proto-creative commons, right? I'm like the original free access to stuff. So when I talk about the public good, you put libraries there. And when you talk about commodities and markets, you put bookstores there. And bookstores and, and libraries have existed for hundreds of, hundreds of years. What we need to figure out though, and if you think about it, bookstores and libraries operate within the same spectrum here, but it took literally a lot of time to figure out how to deal with these two problems and then so the best thing that you guys can do as creators is to document the cases where you know you're trying to criticize uh, whatever kind of movie and you can't because the right owner is, is banging on your door and there's a website for that it's called chillingeffect.org that's creators posting the cease and desist letters from all the and I think Brett Geiler mentions the chillingeffect.org website uh, they post the letters, the cease and desist letters that are completely baseless, right? And it's to uh, get together in associations to provide for, uh, you know, policies and codes of ethics to try to figure out what, what this means for, for fair dealings and other exceptions within your artistic disciplines and having conversations about, about these issues with other creators. But that's the best that I can do to talk about the de dead loss or the net loss effect. And it's actually a, a, an externality. It's like pollution in a way, right? You, people need tires for their cars, but it pollutes a lot. So you, you, you make tires, but you pollute. And that pollution is a, a negative externality. 
And so when you look at the emergence of markets within, uh, within uh, a context of something that could be a public good, you can spot a negative externality. But I'm boring you guys a few minutes before the end of your class, and that's like a no-no. But I think you get my point, though. I hope so. It's my PhD topic. But. <laughs>